ice turns to water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. So an ice age, by definition, means the entire planet's temperature has to be below freezing, right? Well, no. Earth has gone through a lot of changes in its 4.5 billion years. At certain times, the climate has resembled a humid mix of water vapor and solar radiation. Other times, cold snaps lasting millions of years have turned our planet into something more resembling the planet Hoth. Scientists are still trying to fully understand how an ice age happens and might still be happening. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd, and in this episode of Misconceptions, we're going to thaw a few myths about the ice age, from the idea that Earth was once frozen solid to what actually caused the mammoth's extinction. Let's get started. There's only one ice age. There have actually been at least five major ice ages since Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. The first, called the Huronian glaciation, occurred when Earth was about two billion years old, and the only life forms on the planet were bacteria and viruses. Lovely. Before the Huronian glaciation, the atmosphere was a toxic soup of methane, carbon dioxide, and water vapor, and almost no free-floating oxygen. Then, around 2.4 billion years ago, something changed. Cyanobacteria began photosynthesizing energy from the sun and using the water as fuel. They released oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis like plants do today. That's right, our livable atmosphere is thanks to a bunch of microbes breathing. This sudden explosion of oxygen called the Great Oxidation Event replaced the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and cooled the climate so much that it kickstarted the Huronian glaciation. For the next 300 million years, there were colder periods called glacials, in which glaciers extended to Earth's tropical latitudes and relatively warmer periods called interglacials, in which they retreated. Geologists discovered the Huronian Ice Age in the early 20th century thanks to striated glacial rocks exposed near the Great Lakes, and it upended how they understood Earth's development. Many had believed that Earth started out as a super hot globe of molten rock and then steadily cooled over billions of years to the average temperatures that support life. But the glacial rocks around Lake Huron suggested that Earth had experienced much colder intervals in the distant past. After the Huronian, we have the Cryogenian Ice Age from 850 to 530 million years ago, characterized by two periods of snowball Earth. More on that in a minute. It also more or less coincided with the evolution of multicellular organisms. Unfortunately, a lot of them were killed off in a mass extinction during the Indian Saharan Ice Age about 460 to 420 million years ago. We don't know what caused it, but people have proposed boring things like mountain formation or exciting things like that Earth traveled through an interstellar dust cloud and captured so much dust it blotted out the sun. But it's probably the boring thing. Sorry, everybody. About 60 million years go by until we reach the late Paleozoic Ice Age. This ice age lasted from roughly 360 to 260 million years ago, but in that time there were two distinct glacial periods, possibly triggered by the explosive evolution of plants on Earth. As we mentioned before, plants suck up carbon dioxide and release oxygen, and well, see a pattern here? The CO2 in the atmosphere dropped again and the glaciers started expanding. Whew, expanding glaciers, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> oh. Finally, we come to the Cenozoic or Quaternary Ice Age, which began less than three million years ago. That's basically a heartbeat in geological time. The Quaternary is what we think of as the Ice Age, when the Arctic became covered in ice, Antarctica's ice sheet formed tens of millions of years earlier, so some definitions differ and glaciers advanced into warmer territory. Since this ice age is most recent, scientists have been able to learn granular details about its formation and identify one of its drivers as weathering of the Himalayas, which captured atmospheric CO2 in rock. As with previous ice ages, the Quaternary has glacials and interglacials, which scientists think are regulated by subtle changes in Earth's orbit and axial tilt that increase or decrease the amount of sunlight reaching parts of the planet's surface. The last ice age is over. Believe it or not, we're still within the geological time frame of the Quaternary, and the last ice age might still be happening. Scientists divide the Quaternary into two parts, the Pleistocene epoch and the Holocene epoch. The Pleistocene is what we think of as the ice age. It lasted from the beginning of the Quaternary to about 12,000 years ago. It ended when Earth warmed and glaciers retreated. 
Since then, we've been in the Holocene epoch. Its main features are higher average temperatures around the globe and higher sea levels compared to those during the Pleistocene. But, and here's a mind-blowing thought, we may just be in a warm lull in the overall colder epoch. The interglacial periods of the past few hundred thousand years have been around 10 to 30,000 years, which the Holocene is comfortably within, suggesting that the entire Holocene might just be another interglacial interlude. In other words, we might see glaciers again covering much more landmass than today. There is one wrench in that theory, though. Us. Humans have altered the planet and every living thing on it in profound ways. In 2000, the late atmospheric chemist Paul J. Crutzen used the word Anthropocene to describe a new phase of the Holocene in which humans dominated all biological, chemical, and geological processes on Earth, according to the journal Nature. Crutzen was the scientist who discovered that pollutants were destroying the ozone layer in the 1970s, so when he suggested that we have now entered a new age of humans, it sparked intense debate among scientists. Researchers have proposed that the Anthropocene began in the mid-20th century with the first nuclear bomb test in 1945, which was quickly followed by planet-scale developments like mass-produced fertilizer, new plastics, and human migration to cities, all of which chemically altered Earth's systems. Others have pointed to the Anthropocene's beginning at the start of the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century, or even the advent of agriculture. Not all geologists agree that we are in a new geological epoch, or even what to call it if we are, but that's not to say that scientists don't realize the impacts of anthropogenic climate change happening right now. Whether we'll see a future like the day after tomorrow or water world is still up for debate, but I'm gonna start growing my hair out Costner style now anyway. Earth was once covered by solid ice. Snowball Earth. Sounds like an awesome sci-fi movie in which Dwayne The Rock Johnson has to save the planet from an evil yeti, but it actually describes a scientific theory that during the Cryogenian Ice Age, the second of the five big ones, Earth was completely covered in ice, based on the presence of cryogenian glacial deposits all around the world. The thinking is that glaciers had to have covered all of the lands in which these deposits are found, but not all scientists agree with the terminology. The frozen planet concept arose in the mid 20th century when a British geologist named Brian Harland identified evidence for glaciers having once covered tropical low altitude regions. Around the same time, Mikhail Budiko, a Soviet scientist, came up with a model that showed how, if glaciers advanced over most of the globe, the ice would reflect so much sunlight that the Earth would continue to cool indefinitely. In the 1990s, a study by the geobiologist J. L. Kirschvink answered some of the questions posed by the Soviet research and coined the phrase snowball Earth, with later researchers suggesting that the ice-covered state may have lasted as many as 30 million years. But if Earth did freeze solid, how did plants or animals survive? And how exactly did Earth thaw into, like, Florida? Some scientists argue that a more appropriate term for the planet's state in the cryogenian period is slushball Earth, which honestly, I don't know if I'd pay $18 to see that in theaters. This theory, suggested by the paleontologist Richard Cohen, hypothesizes that while most of the land was covered in ice, oceans near the equator were blanketed in only thin crusts of sea ice, which still allowed organisms to photosynthesize sunlight during extreme cold. This would explain how life, even in its most primitive state, was able to survive through the Cryogenian Ice Age, likely the coldest our planet has ever experienced. Later studies have shown more evidence for life finding a way. A group of Yale University geochemists located ancient iron-rich rocks in the Australian outback, an area that was once seabed. The rocks were rusty, meaning that oxygen was present in the marine environment during the Cryogenian Ice Age, and therefore, oxygen-breathing life forms could have survived snowball or slushball Earth, which is good because you're currently alive and watching this. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions, including the rather important how we got out of it, though volcanism may have played a part, and the debate continues. The planet's temperature is below the freezing point during an ice age. The average global temperature has been estimated as low as minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit during the Cryogenian period including its two major glaciations. That is slightly warmer than the current winter average in the village of Oymyakon in eastern Siberia, thought to be the coldest permanently inhabited place on Earth. And it's definitely below the freezing point. But the Quaternary Ice Age has been comparatively and surprisingly 
balmy. Scientists have used proxy data, such as the chemical signatures in deep sea sediments and ice cores, to determine Earth's temperature at the coldest point of its most recent glaciation, a period called the last glacial maximum that peaked about 20,000 years ago. In a 2020 paper in the journal Nature, a group of researchers found the global average was 46 degrees Fahrenheit, or just 11 degrees colder than today's global average. How could the coldest point in the last 20,000 years be the same temperature as New York in November? The key word here is average. Contrary to what you might think, ice ages aren't caused by really bad winters. Winters can sometimes be pretty mild in an ice age. They're a result of cold summers. In a New York winter today, you might get these giant snow drifts, but come August, you're not gonna find any ice that's not in a soda. The temperature difference is enough that there just isn't ice accumulation from one winter to the next. But if the summer cools down, a little bit of that winter ice can make it to the next year, then a little more, then a little more. It might not seem like much, but it can have dramatic effects. For one, glaciers covered 8% of Earth's surface compared to 3% today. 25% of the planet's landmass was under ice. These massive ice sheets started retreating roughly 18,000 years ago, leaving behind signs of their presence that are still visible today, like Lake Erie and Niagara Falls, both created when ice scoured the softer rock underneath. With all that water locked up in land-based glaciers, sea levels were approximately 400 feet lower than they are now. That exposed more coastline around continents and even revealed land masses linking what are now islands and peninsulas. The most historically significant of these land bridges connected present-day eastern Russia to Alaska, allowing humans to migrate from Eurasia to North America, though current archaeology is throwing up some major questions. Ah, probably could have used a better phrase than throwing up, but it's too late, we're all imagining it. Ice ages kill off all the wildlife. We kind of just debunked this misconception with the slushball earth theory, but it wasn't only marine microbes and plankton that survived the most recent ice age. Megafauna, which is the term for animals in a particular region that weigh more than 100 pounds, also lived during these chillier times. Guys like mammoths and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and woolly rhinoceros. Their large size was a mammalian adaptation to the cold. Bigger animals can retain body heat better than smaller ones. This generally holds true, by the way. Polar bears claim a Guinness World Record as the largest carnivore on land. So what happened to these big old mammals? Some have suggested that humans were to blame. We showed up, started hunting the megafauna to extinction. But that's not the whole story. Some scientists argue that in Beringia, after the last glacial maximum, the climate got warmer and wetter. Sea levels rose and covered the land bridge. The dry steppe was replaced by bogs and lakes. Woody shrubs and trees supplanted the grasses. Some animals that could adapt to the new environment, like moose and musk oxen, survived. People also used the woody plants as food and shelter, but herbivores like mastodons, woolly mammoths, and wild horses, and the lions, saber-toothed cats, and short-faced bears that preyed on them began to die out. A 2011 study showed that humans did have a role in some of the animals' extinctions. Researchers looked at six species of megafauna that lived during the Quaternary Ice Age and that were adapted to cold conditions. The woolly rhinoceros, mammoth, wild horse, reindeer, bison, and musk ox. As we mentioned earlier, during the most recent ice age, there have been shifts between warmer and cooler conditions. Researchers examined genetic, archeological, and climate records for clues to how these cold weather animals survived the warmer interglacial periods. They concluded that even during the hot times, the animals found small areas where the climate was still livable, called refugia, and stayed put until the next glaciation. Humans just hunkered down during the last ice age. In winter, it can be so tempting to snuggle under the covers and stay in bed all day. Now, imagine humans doing that for a couple million years, give or take a few thousand. Were people essentially hibernating while glaciers covered a quarter of all the land on Earth? Not even close. Periods during the last ice age saw an explosion of human innovation and culture. And by the way, it wasn't just us. Neanderthals in Europe and another hominin group called the Denisovans in Asia existed at the same time as Homo sapiens did. In recent years, much has been discovered about these cultures. 
they interbred with each other as well as with humans, and their DNA remains present in people today. Neanderthals made tools for specific domestic and hunting uses, established long-term settlements, created and wore clothing, used pigments to decorate objects, and fashioned jewelry, all during an ice age that covered most of northern Europe with glaciers. Unfortunately, both groups went extinct probably sometime before the last glacial maximum. But back to us. Some of the most dazzling evidence for Ice Age humans culture has been found in caves. Sophisticated cave paintings showing realistic renditions of those big Ice Age mammals we just talked about were discovered in caves in Lascaux, France in the 1940s and in nearby Chauvet in the 1990s. The artwork dates back 17,000 years and 35,000 years respectively. There's an even older example of Ice Age cave painting in Indonesia, a sketch of pigs from at least 45,000 years ago with an outside chance it was drawn by Denisovans is the oldest figurative art in history. This period also gave us musical instruments, and archaeologists have found incredibly ancient Ice Age figurines like the Lion Man, carved from mammoth ivory about 40,000 years ago, and the Venus of Hohfels, the oldest known carved human figure from around the same time period. Ice Age people also made jewelry and tools from bones and antlers. So, no matter how tempting it might have been to stay curled up in a bear skin by the fire, Ice Age humans were definitely productive. On that positive note, let's wrap it up there. Thanks for watching Misconceptions, and I hope you feel a little bit closer to our strange, sometimes snowball of a planet. I'll see you next time.